All right, welcome back to ABA exam review and our latest set of BCBA practice questions, where we're going through the next set of questions together and breaking them down. If you're new to the channel, welcome. If you're returning, welcome back. Please like and subscribe. Check out BehaviorAnalystStudy.com for all of our study materials, including our combo pack and practice exams. As always, when you pass, please let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. Let's get going. A 13-year-old client with mild autism is learning how to use a weed eater so that he can help his dad with the lawn. The 13-year-old client typically picks up skills quickly, but it's been a month and data indicate that the 13-year-old is still struggling to learn the task chain. How should you proceed? This question is specifically asking about ongoing evaluation of our treatments, of our behavior plans, of whatever you're implementing with your client. You must consistently reevaluate it. The great thing about what we do is it's organic. It's always changing, meaning if something isn't working, you can change it. Now, the issue becomes, how long do I need to wait before I change anything? And it's hard to convey that in question form because, as always, the data are going to let you know if something's working or if something's not. Now, in this case, we need to evaluate other factors. So in this case, we have this 13-year-old who is learning to use a weed eater so he can help his dad. What we know is the client typically picks up skills quickly, but this time it's been a, a full month and data indicate the 13-year-old is still struggling to learn the task chain. So by all accounts, something isn't working here because you have a client who typically learns quickly, but it's been a whole month and data indicate the 13-year-old is struggling to learn the task chain. So given all that information, how should you proceed? And remember, we're always looking for the best answer. A, eliminate the skill as a target in your treatment plan. Well, the skill is still socially valid, still meaningful. We still need to teach it. We just likely need to teach it in a different way because it's not working as planned. B, reevaluate your task analysis and attempt a different approach. Okay, ongoing evaluation shows it's been a full month. Nothing's improving. They're struggling with the task chain. Let's go back one step to the task analysis and try a different approach. You don't have to jump all the way back, and conduct another FBA and start all over again. Maybe it's just the steps in the task chain. Maybe it's how you're teaching it. So take one step back and see, do we have another way to teach this particular chain? B looks pretty good. C, discontinue services altogether if you're not effective within another month. Well, this is just one skill, right? And so one skill in the grand scheme of things isn't gonna make or break your treatment. However, you do need to adjust in some way. And then D, continue with the intervention since it has worked with other clients in the past. Don't fall into this trap. Everything we do is individualized, client to client, no matter what. We don't plagiarize even our own treatment. So just because the interventions worked with other clients means nothing for this particular client. So don't fall for D's trap. We never, ever plagiarize even our own treatment. Everything's individualized. So how should we proceed? Well, we're going to reevaluate your task analysis and attempt a different approach. Which of the following answer choices represents a functionally equivalent behavior for attention-based off-task behavior? Pretty straightforward question, right? The question is asking about functionally equivalent behavior. And what is functionally equivalent behavior? It is behavior that meets the same purpose, serves the same function as a behavior that it's either replacing or comp, uh, complementing, right? And so we're looking for a functionally equivalent behavior to attention-based off-task behavior. And so since we're looking for the functionally equivalent behavior, our focus is on this idea of attention-based, meaning whatever behavior we choose here needs to serve the function of gaining attention, right? Because this behavior is attention-based, it's used to gain attention in some way, we're picking another behavior that should be functionally equivalent meaning that behavior should also be attention-based. A, the learner asking for a break. Well, if the learner is asking for a break, what are they trying to do? Well, they're trying to get off task. They're trying to escape. Asking for a break is much more closer to escape or avoidance. B, the learner asking if the teacher or therapist would work on the task with them. Okay, so instead of the learner working alone, now they want the teacher or therapist to work with them. Now, there is definitely an attention component there, right? Because they're doing this task, and now somebody's there right there with them, talking them through it, working with them. B looks pretty good. Do we have a better answer? C, the learner completing the worksheet alone in their room. Well, 
C would be more along the lines of automatic. There's no attention going on in C. It can't be equivalent to an attention-based behavior. And then D, the learner playing with the toy while completing the task. Well, he's got this tangible, right? And if the behavior is off task, the toy doesn't meet the attention need. B looks like the best answer. The learner asking if the teacher or therapist would work on the task with them. So we eliminate, right, the off task behavior because now they're working on the task, but they're also getting attention while working on the task. So it's meeting the function and also solving the issue. B looks like our best answer. A parent workshop you hold every Thursday is a place where parents can learn and discuss ABA interventions. Tonight you're discussing extinction. One parent raised their hand and said that they are comfortable using extinction, but that their child stays with grandparents two nights a week and the grandparents would not want to use the procedure. How should you respond? Let's think through this one. How are you going to respond to this parent? What's the, the main issue here? What's the primary issue? Remember, we always want to understand our question first. We have a parent workshop where you discuss ABA interventions. Tonight, you're discussing extinction. So immediately start thinking extinction, right? Withholding reinforcement. One parent raised their hand and they said, well, we're comfortable using extinction. It's great. But the child stays with grandparents two nights a week and the grandparents do not want to use the procedure. Meaning two out of the seven nights a week, extinction is not happening. Is that a problem? Well, of course, extinction has to occur as close to 100% of the time as, as possible to truly be effective. What's going to happen is the parents are going to follow through with extinction, work very hard at it, and then the child is going to go to grandparents' house where extinction is no longer taking place, and that behavior is likely getting reinforced. That's a big issue. That's going to cause extreme resistance to extinction. That's a problem. So how should you respond? A, explain the extinction would still be effective in the scenario. Now, I mean, it could be, but the, the likelihood is very low. So this idea of that extinction would be, meaning it's definitely going to be, is just unlikely. B, explain that the grandparents should not watch their child if they are not willing to implement interventions. Absolutely not, right? The, the grandparents have every right to watch their, their grandchild. Uh, we need to work within the confines of the environment and our stakeholders to, to serve them best. Barring the grandparents from watching the child is not the right move. C, explain the likelihood of extinction working in this scenario is reduced drastically. Yes, that's what you have to tell them. We love that you are comfortable using extinction, but if you're going to use extinction, it needs to happen consistently in all environments. If two nights a week it's not happening, we might have to approach something else, or you might have to talk with grandparents. And then D, explain that punishment should be used instead in this scenario. Well, no, we're going to try reinforcement and extinction first, right, before we jump to punishment. And if the grandparents aren't happy about extinction, how is punishment going to look to them, right? So we can't just jump to the more extreme measure of punishment. We're not there yet. So how should you respond? Well, you've got to explain if this is the case, the likelihood of extinction working is reduced drastically. If you were to use equivalence-based instruction in a treatment or behavior plan, what would you be focusing on during intervention? All right, interesting. We have equivalence-based instruction. Now, what is equivalence-based instruction? Well, we're teaching concepts because we're taking stimuli and showing how they equal each other. If I have a picture of a ball and I have a basketball and I'm teaching you that the picture matches the, the ball, we're teaching concepts. It's how we teach uh, matching. It's how we teach categories. It's how we teach functional classes. Equivalence-based instruction, very strong. So what is it called when we're, when we're doing this sort of matching to sample? Well, we're, it, we're going through the process of reflexivity, symmetry, and transitivity, right? And that's the whole idea of equivalence-based instruction. So if we look at A, the fair pair rule, the fair pair rule says if you decrease or take away a behavior, you must replace it with something equivalent. But we're not talking about that here. We're talking about equivalence-based instruction, concept formation. B, functional equivalence, which we talked about earlier, is just a behavior that meets the same function as another behavior. We're talking about instruction here. And so if you look at C, reflexivity, symmetry, and transitivity, this is what we're talking about when we're focused on equivalence-based instruction. A equals A, and then A equals B, B equals A, and hoping after that, the learner derives that since A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. And that's the idea behind 
transitivity. And that's the idea, idea behind deriving concepts. Equivalence-based instruction is associated with reflexivity, symmetry, and transitivity. And then D, pairing unconditioned and conditioned reinforcers, just not relevant to equivalence-based instruction in this particular question. D is not a good answer. The answer we're looking for is C. What are we focusing on? We're focusing on reflexivity, symmetry, and transitivity. Of the following choices, which ones are essential components of collaboration with a multidisciplinary team? So a multidisciplinary team is a team of people that com are comprised who are looking to help a learner or a client or compl complete a goal. And that team is going to be you, the BCBA, it's going to be the parents, it might be teachers, it might be other therapists. Regardless, that team has all these different backgrounds, all these different skills, all these different disciplines, and we're focused on a common goal. Since we're focused on a common goal, we've got to collaborate. Collaboration is key. What are essential components of collaboration? A, share information willingly with others. Absolutely. That information that you're gathering during your assessments, during your supervision, during your observation, that is not just your information. It's valuable data that can be used in schools and other therapies and homes. Share your information, okay? It's not yours to keep, right? You should be open about what you're learning with others. So A looks pretty good. B, obtain information and seek out information proactively. As you share information with others, you should be seeking information from teachers and parents and other therapists and doctors. And the more information we share, the better. It makes us better, makes us smarter, makes us know the client more uh, thoroughly. C, accept feedback from other team members regarding your plans. This one's difficult, right? We're ABA, we're dealing with behavior. You might have the best behavior plan in the world. Let's say the occupational therapist comes in, says, well, I, I see what you're doing and I've tried this or I've seen this before. And that can be hard to accept, right? Because that's your plan, you've worked hard on it. But we've got to collaborate and they might have a good idea. They might know what they're talking about. So collaboration is not easy, but it's necessary. So what are essential components? You're going to share information with others. You're going to obtain information from others, and you're going to accept feedback from other team members regarding your plans. You're going to do all of these things. A couple is redoing their kitchen and are looking at different types of cabinets. They open a magazine, which has nine different options. The wife tells her husband to pick his favorite, and then she'll pick her favorite, and they'll go back and forth until no cabinets are left. What type of preference assessment does this most resemble? Preference assessment question, and we always ask ourselves to start, how many stimuli are we assessing? If it's one, it's likely single choice. If it's two, it's forced choice or paired choice. If it's three or more, it's likely multiple stimulus. If it's naturalistic, it's likely free operant. That's kind of the chain of events. In this case, we have a couple who's going through a magazine with nine different options. We have many, many, many stimuli, and they're evaluating them all at the same time. Immediately, we eliminate A, forced choice. Forced choice is when you present two options at a time, you pick. We've got nine options in an array. It's not free operant because it's contrived. It's all in a magazine. They're not just in the environment looking around. Now, if they were at, let's say, the store, the actual cabinet store, and they were just walking around looking, that's much more closer to free operant. Here they have nine options in a magazine. That's their picks. So we have multiple stimulus. Is it with replacement or without? When a multiple stimulus with replacement, whatever item is picked is put back in the array. The other items are removed and replaced. In this case, what they're doing is they're picking a favorite, then they'll pick, then the wife will pick a favorite, and they'll go back and forth until no cabinets are left, meaning nothing's being added in or replaced. So what they're doing is a multiple stimulus without replacement. The carryover effects are commonly thought of as a disadvantage for what experimental design. Now, think of sequence effects and think of carryover effects. Sequence effects are typically thought of in reversal designs and the order of the interventions, or I should say conditions, right? And those order affects the, the subsequent condition. With carryover effects, the independent variable 
affects future outcomes. And when might that be an issue? Well, if you think of alternating treatment designs and we're rapidly alternating independent variables, what you tend to see is slowly the behavior gets better and better across all independent variables because the learner is learning. And so at the beginning, there might be a clear distinction between independent variables, but as you rapidly shift between them, the learner is learning more and more and more and more. The, the effect of the independent variable is carrying over into the next independent variable. And so carryover effects are commonly thought of as a disadvantage for alternating treatment designs for that specific purpose. Now, we've mentioned sequence effects. Alternating treatment designs a lot of times are good for minimizing sequence effects because you're not changing conditions necessarily. In reversal designs, you're, you're often changing conditions, which is why we get those sequence effects. But you really only have one IV in each condition. So understand the difference between those two and why an alternating treatment design is an advantage in some cases and a disadvantage in some cases. And that's important to note why each experimental design is useful in certain situations, and when might they actually be more of its disadvantage? That's one of the harder parts of understanding experimental design. Thank you for watching. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials. ABA exam review, spread the word, let your friends, your colleagues know. Like, subscribe, let us know when you pass, work hard, study hard. See you soon.